Welcome everybody uh, to our colloquium. It is my pleasure to host today Dr. Joanna Drążkowska. So Joanna did her master's back in 2011 at Nikol Nikolaus Copernicus University in Toruń, which is also the place where I got my master's. So she's my kind of, let's say, colleague, although we didn't overlap, I think. Well, maybe just a bit. Then she, then she did her PhD at Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics in Heidelberg uh, uh, in 2014. Later, she moved for one postdoc at, at Zurich Institute for Computer Science. And since 2018, Joanna works at Faculty of Physics, uh, University Observatory of Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, in Germany. And today she will uh, talk uh, about changing paradigms in planet formation. The floor is yours, Joanna, please. And thanks, Maciej. So thank you very much for inviting me. So in the next um, half an hour or 40 minutes, I will try to tell you how our understanding of planet formation has been changing in the past years. And it is not really a coincidence that I am starting uh, this talk with the illustration of our own solar system with its amazing uh, dichotomy of uh, the gas giant planets that are a bit farther away from the sun. And here we have uh, like the, the sizes of the planets are to scale and the distances of the planets are also to scale, but this is a different scale because otherwise uh, we wouldn't be able to really see um, any planets. So the distances should be uh, much, much uh, larger <laughs> if, if we were to keep the scale of the sizes. But anyway, you can see that in the solar system, we have these like four gas giant planets. And then we have this kind of a belt of rocky planets, including the one that we are sitting on now. And for many years, this was the only planetary system that we were absolutely sure existed. So this kind of classical planet formation theory was purely based on reproducing this architecture. Uh, however, things have, have changed, uh, but before we get to this, um, let's start from the beginning. So planets are born in accretion disks and those accretion disks are called circumstellar or protoplanetary disks and they surround um, young stars. And those disks um, are pretty much made of hydrogen helium gas and about 1% of heavier elements that we are calling dust or solids. So those condense at the temperatures that we have in the protoplanetary disk, these uh, heavier elements condense out and form dust grains. And then out of these dust grains uh, that are just 1% of mass, we have to make the rocky cores of planets. And in the classical view, that is still something that uh, you will find in the textbooks, um, the, the dust grains were very quickly sedimenting to the midplane of the disk and were forming gravitationally bound objects. And those first gravitationally bound building blocks of planets are called planetesimals. And then the planetesimals were then continuing to grow through funny processes. And uh, the first one is called the runaway growth. And basically what it means is that the planetesimals that are initially for some reason born a little bit larger uh, than other planetesimals, they are growing much, much faster. And this is the runaway growth. However, the runaway growth was then from the models of planetesimal interactions um, quickly over and was turned to another mode of growth that was called the oligarchic growth. And the name comes because those largest planetesimals that grew much, much faster are in this classical theory called the oligarchs. So then the, the whole point of the oligarchic growth is that the oligarchs are just clearing their direct orbital surrounding and are forming the cores of planets. And then the cores of planets that grew large enough, quickly enough when the gas disk was still present, 
um, they were able to accrete the gas and become the gas giants. And those oligarchs that didn't manage to grow large enough, quickly enough, they were just uh, left as a course of rocky planets like the Earth. And um, the, the lifetime of the gas disk is um, about uh, three to five million years on average. So this sets us this kind of hard deadline for forming the, the massive cores of gas giant planets in this picture. And um, the big success of this classical paradigm of planet formation was that it was predicting that the um, cores of ga gas giants can only form outside of so-called water snow line. So here we have a plot where we are uh, looking at the distance to the central star. So the sun would be somewhere here and one AU is where Earth is. And then um, three AU is roughly where this water snow line is. So outside of three AU, the disk is cold enough for icy grains to exist in the solid form. Excuse me, this must be star flux normalized, right? So this is for a sun-like star. Uh, yeah, exactly. So the, okay, here we are just talking about this kind of classical paradigm that is purely aimed at the explaining okay. the solar system. So we are only looking at, at the sun. So of course, around um, much um, brighter stars, we will have the snow line pushed um, um, to, the, to the outer parts. And then um, we, uh, on the y-axis, we have the uh, mass of our object. So one Earth mass in the units of Earth mass, right? So one would be where, um, where the Earth is. And then um, we are comparing just sort of uh, analytical predictions. And we have two lines here. So um, looking at the orange line, this is the maximum mass that a rocky core can grow to just as this or in this picture of an oligarch clearing its direct gravitational surrounding. And this will be called the isolation mass. And this increases with the distance to the star because the oligarchs that are located farther away, they kind of are having a larger feeding zone so they can eat more of the planetesimals. And then we have to compare this to the blue line, which is what we need to start the process of accreting gas, right? So if we are able to grow our core above the blue line, it means that this planet will be able to start to accrete its gas atmosphere out of this primordial um, hydrogen helium gas from the disk. So this um, mass decreases with the distance um, to the star and this is purely because it is much easier to accrete cold gas than it would be to accrete warm gas from the inner parts of the system. So this was um, the, the lines then cross at the snow line. At the snow line, we have uh, this kind of rapid change of conditions because we have much more mass available because the ice is in the solid form. And uh, yeah, there are also some changes for the opacity of the gas. That's why uh, the blue line also makes a small jump. But anyway, the prediction is roughly that the gas giants can only form in the outer part um, of, the, of the disk. And then of course, so, so this was the big success. The, the classical paradigm was kind of explaining the architecture of the solar system. However, it had some problems. The first problem was that it like was making this big assumption that the planetesimals, this gravitationally bound, objects are formed somehow very quickly. People couldn't really find the process that would be doing this, but that was just like an assumption. And then other problem was that the time scale of forming these um, rocky cores was increasing with the distance to the star and where Jupiter is, it was already taking 10 million years to form a core of Jupiter. And, um, so that was much longer than average gas disk is observed to live. But anyway, people were thinking since we only have the solar system to explain, maybe there were some special conditions that sped up the, the growth of planets. But then, of course, the exoplanets started to be discovered in large numbers. And 
we um, now the, here we have the comparison of the mass distribution sort of, of the planets in the in the solar system to all the known exoplanets. And of course, due to observational and detection biases, it is much easier to detect larger planets. So um, on the top part of the diagram and also planets that are closer in to their uh, central star. So um, to the to the left of this diagram, but still the statistics. So the comparison of what we should be able to discover and what we are detecting uh, tells us that planets are extremely common. So that the planet formation process is basically as common as the star formation process. And another thing that we learned from the, all these exoplanet discoveries was that planets are extremely diverse. So for example, the most popular type of exoplanets that we are detecting are those here that are called super Earths or sub uh, Neptunes. And they fall exactly in between these rocky planets in the solar system like Earth and Venus and the gas giants like Uranus and Neptune. So they are exactly in between. And we cannot really, like the, the kind of classical um, theory of planet formation was not expecting this. Another group that was like um, historically the first planets to be discovered were these, kind, these hot Jupiters. So planets that are like Jupiter, but much closer. So closer into their central star than Mercury is in the solar system. And that was also a big problem for the classical theory of planet formation that as I explained, you only predicted that gas giants can form outside of the water snow line. And then another revolution has happened, which is that we are able to look um, into the birthplaces of planets, so the circumstellar disks with much higher resolution. So here is what the best picture of a protoplanetary disk in millimeter wavelength looked like until 2014. So basically just a blob of radiation at millimeter wavelengths that was telling us that there is dust surrounding the star. And then when the ALMA, so Atacama Large Millimeter Array came to life with its uh, full um, resolution, then we were able to learn that basically every circumstellar disk that we are able to resolve um, shows this substructure, as we call it. So it shows the, the bright rings and uh, dark gaps. And now we have quite a few of the, those, those disks imaged with a higher resolution. And we see that, yeah, each of them has some sort of substructure. This substructure is commonly interpreted as a signature of planet formation already ongoing in those disks. And of course, the valid question would be whether we can see the planet formation process now as uh, we have all this progress. But unfortunately, the answer is not. So the only thing that we see is the end product of planet formation as the population of exoplanets. And we see the very early stages. So if we look at millimeter wavelength, this roughly corresponds to the millimeter sized uh, pebbles as we call them in the disk. So we are looking at the mid plane um, of, the, of those disks. If we look at uh, shorter wavelengths in the scattered light, we see the surface um, of the disks. However, from this kind of intermediate regime where the planetesimal stage would be, we don't have any useful radiation. Um, however, what we have is some input from our own solar system where we kind of got some leftover planetesimals as we think. So the asteroids, comets, and the Kuiper belt objects. And I will tell you later that these are actually very important to, to theory of planet formation. So what we need to cover, so to connect between the, this um, protoplanetary disk stage and the planet population is models. And this is exactly what I'm doing. However, um, if you look at the, the state of the art um, of planet formation theory, you will find that there is a big gap 
and the, uh, the gap is because the models that end up with planets they would make assumptions still like in this classical theory of planet formation that uh, planetesimals and planetary cores already formed somehow very quickly. But on the other hand, if you look at the models that deal with coagulation of smaller dust grains, they will typically end without producing anything larger than centimeter sizes. And to understand where this problem is coming from, where this disconnection is really coming from, we have to look a little bit closer at, of what is the physics of, um, of the protoplanetary disk. So if we focus on some portion of gas um, that is a star, you, um, you need to take into account three forces, which are the gravitational force, the centrifugal force, and from these two, it's very well known, you would get just a very it's much higher in the inner part of the disk than it is in the, in the outer part of the disk, just because it is warmer and uh, denser here. So the pressure gradient is negative. And this means that the rotation velocity of gas will be slightly subcaplarian. So will be the, the, the difference between the gas rotation and the caplarian speed is um, usually below 1%. But this already makes a huge uh, difference, and especially for the dust grains. So if we will be a dust grain and we would like to be on our Keplerian orbit, all the gas molecules are kind of going against us. And this is called the headwind. And the biggest implication of the headwind is that the dust grain will lose its angular momentum because the of the aerodynamic interaction um, with the gas and will be drifting inwards towards the star. And then the, this is called the radial drift. And the velocity of the radial drift depends on the size of the, of the dust grains. And we typically measure the size of the dust grains in terms of so-called Stokes number, which is a ratio between the stopping time of the grain and the orbital time. And it's just proportional to the to the grain size. So very small grains are very well coupled to the gas, and they would be just flowing with the accretion flow of the gas with some moderate velocities. Very large grains, like the planetesimals, they would just be on Keplerian orbits, so they wouldn't really drift inward. But we have this awkward intermediate regime where the, the radial drift speeds are really problematic, are uh, really high, and they correspond to Stokes number of unity, which at one AU, so where the Earth is, would be about one meter. So this is why this radial drift problem was traditionally called the meter size barrier, because at one meter size, all the dust grains would are lost um, to the, just are falling basically onto the star on time scales that are much shorter than the lifetime of the disk. So now if we put the radial drift um, in our models, um, we can kind of see uh, what, is the, what, what is the effect and how it depends on what size our dust grains have. So now we are again having the distance to the central star on the x-axis. Now it's in, in the, on the log scale. So Earth would be here in the, in the inner boundary. And um, we are looking now on the evolution of the surface density. So just the density distribution. In blue line, we have gas. And in orange line, we have dust. And I made two models that start with exactly the same initial condition. But the difference is that on the left-hand side, we assume that all the dust grains have size of one millimeter, and we keep this dust grain size fixed. And on the right-hand side, um, I'm using a kind of state-of-the-art prescription for dust coagulation. And I made these models with uh, the dust by coat, which is developed here in Munich by Sebastian Stammler and Phil Bierstiel. So now if we play this animation, you will see the difference in how the orange line is evolving in the, in the two cases. 
So if we keep our grain size fixed at one millimeter, we can we have this out, outside in depletion of dust. And this is because in the outer part of the disc, the, the size of one millimeter it corresponds to a higher Stokes number basically than uh, in the inner part of the disc. So they are closer to this critical uh, drift speed. And um, in, the, in the right side panel uh, with dust coagulation, we have kind of a different picture of evolution. And why is this uh, such a big difference? Um, to <laughs> get to this, we have to look a little bit into how dust coagulation proceeds. So the governing equation for dust coagulation is the Smolukovsky coagulation equation. And the Smolukovsky coagulation equation basically needs three inputs that we need to give it to, to model how dust coagulation proceeds. So the first is input that we need is what are the collision speeds? So what are the relative velocities of two grains of different sizes? And these relative velocities, for example, come from the radial drift, right? Because larger grains will have higher drift speed than smaller grains. So they will lead to some relative velocities. So for other systematic processes, just basically parallel to the radial drift is the vertical settling and the azimuthal drift. And we also have some uh, stochastic processes like turbulence and the Brownian motion. And for these, we basically have, uh, they come from our models. So from the theory of how the protoplanetary disk works. But we also need to understand what is the cross section for the collisions. So all the models that I showed you until now, they assume that the grains are just compact spheres. So it's very easy to calculate the cross section is just a geometric cross section. And this could change a lot if we have, for example, a very porous grains that have a large surface to, to mass ratio or if our grains have some electric charge that is also modifying how likely they are to meet. And then we also need to know what is the outcome of a collision. So what happens if two grains meet? And for, calcul like for knowing what, what happens and also for knowing the cross sections, we need the laboratory experiments. So in Germany, we have two laboratories in Braunschweig and in Duisburg. And they deal with performing this sort of collision experiments between pre-planetary dust analogs. And those experiments look more or less like this. So they create the, the um, dust aggregates with very like controlled sizes and internal structure. And then they put them in some collision chambers these are, are in vacuum and also in microgravity. So basically made in some drop towers, for example, or on board of um, parabolic flights. And then they <laughs> analyze the results and they tell us what happens when two grains of given size collide at a given speed. And the biggest conclusion from all the experiments is that as soon as, uh, like, as long as the, the collision speeds are low, uh, the grains can stick. But for the experiments that are at um, higher collision speeds, the, the collisions don't lead to sticking anymore. And for, for high speeds, they may be catastrophic collisions. So that our dust aggregates will just fragment. So to simplify the picture uh, from uh, the input from laboratories, we would often introduce this parameter that is called the fragmentation speed. That is the boundary between when the aggregates still stick and when they start to fragment. And as you may guess from, from the numbers here, this fragmentation velocity is uh, in the order of magnitude of meter per second. So typically we put something like one meter per second. In, as the fragmentation velocity. And then knowing about the radial speed and knowing about that the collisions cannot really go to too high velocities for sticking, we can build our 
global picture of dust evolution that explains what we have seen before in the results. So if we compare the time scale of radial drift to the time scale of, of the growth of dust aggregates, we, we can kind of plot where in the disk. So again, the x-axis is just the distance to the central star and y-axis is now our grain size. So I marked the, the Stokes number of unities. So where the radial drift problem is um, the most serious um, with this line here. And then the, um, the shaded region is the radial drift um, part, right? So if we put our grain here, it would be just drifting inwards. It don't, doesn't have any time to grow because the growth time scale is too long. And then the other problem is where the fragmentation um, velocity is exceeded in the collisions. And this is this orange regime. So now if we make like a super simple model and we put some test particles um, at um, what is the size, something like 10 micron size at different locations in our disk and we let them grow and um, drift, we find the, the that the grains that are closer in to the star, they grow much faster, but they also then hit the, the fragmentation barrier. So they cannot really break through. And then the grains that start farther out in the disk, they are impacted by the radial drift problem be even before they hit the, this fragmentation barrier. So this is basically how, how the dust evolution proceeds in the disk. And the biggest conclusion of all that I just told you is that we don't really see any way to cross this meter size barrier. So even the, the centimeter size barrier. So we either hit the fragmentation barrier or we hit the radial drift barrier. And um, that's how we arrive at this disconnection between the models of dust coagulation and the models that want to form planets so, and they need to start with already gravitationally bound blocks because they don't really see any way to connect. Can I have a silly question now? Mm -hmm. interrupt. So I guess you need to assume some kind of a composition of this dust, especially like metallicity, what kind of a material it is. And I would imagine that some of these parameters you derive in laboratory or in Mercury would depend on the composition. Like for example, coagulated metals may sticky with magnetic field a bit easier than just uh, chondroids, which is the which is the which is the carbon base. So, is the, does it have any big impact, or this is just too small to do it? Yeah, it is actually the the kind of parameter space of possible compositions is something that is just kind of getting explored in the laboratory experiment. Also, the temperature, because as you said, for example, hot metal <laughs> is very much more sticky than cold metal. Uh, so current experiment indeed focus on exploring this and we yeah so the, the there are there is really not so many models that include that yet but yeah it's a re definitely an avenue that we are exploring now right thanks but anyway actually it turns out that the solution <laughs> to to this problem may not be to force some kind of growth through uh, this barrier so it turns out that it's actually better not to turn too much dust to gravitationally bound objects. And this is also what the protoplanetary disk observations tell us, that these millimeter-sized grains are present in the disks through basically as long as the gas is present. And the, the solution for forming planetesimals that is now the most widely accepted um, solution is called the streaming instability. And streaming instability is um, hydrodynamic instability that arises basically from the radi radial drift mechanics. So what happens is now we are looking at the, we can imagine that we are looking at the midplane of, the, of a protoplanetary disk from the top. We are looking at a very small portion of the midplane. It's actually a local hydrodynamic model using the shearing box approach, so kind of emulating the fact that the disk has differential rotation. And we are looking at the density of pebbles, so kind of a larger dust aggregate. And this simulation 
already starts with assuming some sort of perturbation in the initial density of pebbles, right? And if the conditions are right, those kind of models find, also it was first found analytically, that th those perturbations are unstable. So a local over density will grow in density and the, the, some of those over densities may increase their mass so much that they will become gravitationally unstable and they will collapse directly to gravitationally bound planetesimals. And this is now, of course, very intensely studied. Uh, it, there are many papers every month about streaming instability, but it is a pathway to kind of go over all this problematic regime and go directly from those pebbles, so millimeter to centimeter size that we can still grow in, in the dust coagulation models and go directly to large planetesimals because the streaming instability actually puts most mass in roughly 100 kilometer size planetesimals. And now recent years have brought kind of a very strong evidence that it was indeed the streaming instability that seeded planetesimal formation in the solar system. And this is because the, the yeah, if we come back to this model, we um, you may, if you look closely, sorry, <laughs> you may be able to see um, that um, those planetesimals that are forming here, many of them are binary. So they are kind of connected, right? And rotating around each other. And this is, it seems that this is exactly what we see in the solar system. So I think five of seven comets that were visited by, by spacecraft turned out to be exactly uh, binary objects. And also recently the New Horizon mission to this kind of primordial Kuiper belt object called Arakot, it also reveals that is in fact um, a binary planetesimal. And another thing that fits is that the direction of rotation of these binary planetesimals exactly matches so what is found in the in, in the streaming instability simulations and um, in the Kuiper belt. So this is really treated as a proof that the streaming instability see that uh, planet formation in the solar system. However, the thing about streaming instability is that it needs this kind of pebble to gas ratio to be already relatively high. So I told you at the, in the first slide of the talk that um, the, the dust to gas ratio in the, in the circumstellar disks is about 1%. And the streaming instability needs at least dust to gas ratio of a couple percent. So we need to find places in the protoplanetary disk where the where we have some sort of over density of pebbles to even trigger planetesimal formation. And a big part of my studies focused on finding such locations in the in the disk. So connecting between the models of dust evolution and um, models of, of the streaming instability. And one of the locations that is the most promising and most favorable is actually the snow line. So this is kind of a co coming back to this classical paradigm of planet formation where the snow line was very important place. It is still an important place. It's just in a kind of a different way. So as I told you at the beginning, outside of the snow line, we have already more uh, kind of this jump of the, of the amount of solids because the ice exists in the solid form. But it is not it. Also, um, the laboratory experiments were telling us that icy dust aggregates are more sticky than dry dust aggregates, right? So coming back to, to the question um, before. So that was one of the conclusions. So this would mean then in the models that they can grow to larger sizes before they encounter this fragmentation barrier. But also, if they grow to larger sizes, it means that they are drifting much faster than smaller grains. So what we are getting is some sort of a global traffic jam effect, right? Because those large aggregates arrive at the snow line, 
but then they cannot continue to drift because they, 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 the small aggregates inside of the snow line don't really drift. So that again leads to an increase of the, of the solids. In the recent years, um, laboratory experiments kind of turned this conclusion back and they said that uh, if they now do experiments with better temperature control, they find that icy dust is not so sticky. It is only sticky when it is close to its melting point. So basically at the snow line directly. So this picture may change a little bit uh, when we will do new models now, but um, there is also another effect uh, which helps us to increase the amount of solids that we have just outside of the water snow line. And it is called the cold finger effect. So cold finger means that if uh, we have the water vapor inside of the snow line, it diffuses at higher rates than the dust diffuses and then it uh, recondenses on dust aggregates that are just outside of the snow line. So we again increase the amount of solids that we have available. And that's how the snow line is becoming the, the favorable place for triggering planet formation. So then the cold finger effect is actually much faster than this traffic jam effect that I showed on the previous slide because the traffic jam needs to wait until all the aggregates will grow, even in the outer part of the disk. The cold finger doesn't need to wait, so it is faster, but it's also a little bit um, less efficient. So now if we put all the things together, <laughs> uh, I will, we, will, we are arriving at this model that connects between dust coagulation and uh, planetesimal formation. And on top of that, we are also here considering that the disk doesn't exist yet. The protoplanetary disk will just be built in this model. And this is very important. This is why this plot is for now empty. So on the top panel, we will have a type of a plot that we have already seen. So we will be following the surface density of gas and dust. And also in red will be emerging planetesimal population. And on the bottom panel, we will be sort of recording the history of planetesimal formation. So on y-axis now we have time. And again, one AU is where Earth is. And five AU is roughly where Jupiter is. So now if we play this simulation, we are building our disk in some sort of inside out mode. So um, with the mass first fall, close to the star, I can say it again. And the blue line here is where the snow line is. So the snow line position also moves because the disk first heats up and then it cools down, right? So we have this sort of a tack motion of the, of the snow line with time. And in the first phase where we are just building the disk, we already form some planetesimals. And this is thanks to this cold finger effect that is very quick, but is not so efficient. And then later we form much more planetesimals. And this is mostly thanks to this traffic jam effect. So the, these large aggregates drifting and increasing the, the, the solid amount um, inside of the snow line actually, but outside of the snow line also benefits from this. So what we are getting is this kind of two waves of planetesimal formation. One is very early, but very little planetesimals. And then uh, later we have much more planetesimals. So when we first got these results, we didn't really think that much of them. But um, at the time I was <laughs> working in, in Zurich in a collaboration that also included some people from um, geology and uh, ge geochemistry department. And um, when they have seen that, they got much more excited because they realized that this is maybe something that we need to explain the, the architecture of the solar system. And uh, in fact, it took us a couple of years to <laughs> figure all this out, but in the end, we managed to, to publish this in science. So why does, it, does this explain the solar system formation? You can see this is exactly the plot that was uh, on, on the previous slide just yeah with some things added and uh, some colors changed. But um, basically the planetesimals that 
form very early. So the, the, the ones here, the, the little bit of planetesimals, they will inherit a lot of short-lived radioactive elements. So mostly aluminum 26 that we know from the studies of meteorites was quite abundant in the early uh, solar nebula. And then what happens when they have a lot of aluminum 26 is that the, that the radioactive decay will hit the, those planetesimals and they will lose their water and they will also mm, melt the iron and form iron core. And then for planetesimals that formed later, so after a couple million years, they don't, like this is log scale, right? So they will get orders of magnitude less aluminum 26 because it has a, a lifetime of, um, of less than million years. So it will already decay in the gas disk and not inside of the planetesimals. And then what we did basically was that we post-processed these results with models of internal structure of planetesimals, including this heating by aluminum 26 decay. And we found that all the planetesimals pretty much that formed early in this reservo reservoir one, they will go through this dehydration and iron core formation, while the, the ones that formed later, so our reservoir two, they, most of them won't go tr um, through these processes. So this is basically how we are getting the dichotomy of the planets, right? As what we have in the solar system. So the, the ones that are close in are not really dry because they are close in, but they are dry because they formed early and they lost water this way. And on top of that, we have all the theory of planet migration that was actually needed to explain, for example, the hot Jupiters. So the planets don't really stay where they form most of the time. And then the, these results that we got here, they really fit what we find in the solar system in terms of the iron core formation ages. So but from, the, from the studies of meteorites, we can actually say when the iron core has formed. And in fact, in the meteorites that are coming from some so-called non-carbonaceous reservoir, they have um, much older, older cores, which would fit with our picture of them being this very early uh, planetesimal that even formed during the, the time that the solar disk was still forming. So what we are now is, I'm basically at the end of my talk, and we are coming to this new emerging picture of planet formation theory that we have as a multifaceted process that starts with dust growth and then has this kind of two windows of mobility, has the radial drift window at pebble sizes, and then has the other window of mobility when the solids get redistributed, actually planets get redistributed in the disk in the process of planet migration. And then we have this big jump that the streaming instability gives us from pebble sizes to large planetesimal sizes. And then we, we have still the, the planetesimal accretion, so the runaway and oligarchic growth. But then we have another very important development of planet formation theory in the last years, which is called the pebble accretion. So I haven't really talked about pebble accretion. I will just do it in the next slide. But this is um, something that then helps us to, to get to this regime where gas accretion is possible. So to forming uh, gas giants, even in the inner parts of the, of the system. And then um, pebble accretion basically comes from realization that for a planetary core, it is much better to accrete pebbles, so this millimeter, centimeter size solids than planetesimals because planetesimals get, they don't really interact with gas so much and it is very um, very easy to steer them and to um, to eject them actually than to accrete them while for pebbles the accretion is aided by by their interaction with gas right so 
Um, so the, the planetary core is much more likely to accrete a, a small solid than a large solid. And then there is another benefit from accreting pebbles, and it is that the size of the speeding zone, so where the, the planetary core reaches, also increases greatly. Because as I told you, planetesimals basically don't drift through the disk. So a oligarch that is growing here can only reach a limited, limited amount of planetesimals. But the pebbles are very mobile. So a planetary core can just sit there and wait for pebbles to come even from the outer parts of the disk. And this is um, how we can grow to larger cores by pebble accretion than by planetesimal accretion. So what we really need now and what we are doing is doing this sort of self-consistent models that are connecting between planetary cores and dust evolution, right? So in, for example, here we have a simulation that is a 2D full disk hydrodynamic simulation. And this is a dust density plot. There is a, a Jupiter mass planet sitting here and, and opening a gap uh, in, the, in the dust, also in the gas. And also um, in this plot, kind of every pixel of dust density, in fact, is a mass distribution of, of dust. So we include all the dust um, species and we include the coagulation self-consistently this way. So this is really the, the future. Of course, these kind of models are very, very expensive. So we have to think of uh, more clever <laughs> approaches, but this is yeah, something that we are doing. And this is pretty much the end. So I think the, I, I, I showed you how our understanding of planet formation is changing and that the most important thing that we found is first the streaming instability. So how we go from dust to the first gravitationally bound objects. And the other is the pebble accretion. So the fact that it's actually better not to turn all the dust to planetesimals, but keep a lot of dust and grow the planetary cores by accreting pebbles rather than planetesimals. Yeah, so this is pretty much it. If, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joanna, very much for the very interesting and enlightening talk. Um, indeed, we have time for questions, so uh, please feel free to either ask directly or or to raise your hand. Yes, Agnieszka, please. Good afternoon, Joanna. A very interesting uh, talk, of course. Uh, I have a, one question about these radioactive elements. You showed us the isotopes. Yeah. Aluminium 26 and, and the iron and also uranium. Yes, there is a little bit of uranium in our solar system. So are they needed to explain the formation of all the planets or they are more important for the rocky planets? Um, I didn't understand the point. Yeah. So uh, basically that, so what we are showing here is that the, the cores of planets that form early or out of building blocks that form early they will be dry and they will also be already differentiated, right? Those planetesimals. For forming Jupiter, for example, we need that water. So we cannot really get rid of that much water. That's why, that, that is why basically it needs to form later. So this is actually another thing is that, of course, this model was made for the solar system, but one may imagine that if another disk starts with a different budget of these um, radioactive elements, then this system will form very different planets. Right? Yes, that was my follow-up question, actually, how to, to somehow understand the formation of other solar or stellar systems and, and planets uh, where the abundances of elements may be very different, yes, because they originate from, from different regions in, in the galaxies. Exactly, so this is why uh, this, this model is kind of more natural in explaining the exoplanet um, diversity, we can imagine, because a small change in, in the, the, the initial abundance that we actually, is something that we expect pretty much, uh, will be able to lead to then different planetary architectures. And we, we, yeah, 
So we hope that this, uh, of course, we didn't really do the models yet, but we hope that this will be a more natural explanation. Thank you for your answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question, two more questions. First, uh, Professor Turski, please. Uh, I have a question concerning the streaming instability, the streaming coagulation or Mm -hmm. creation of these planets. Usually, if we have a hydrodynamic theory of that kind, there is a scaling law, mm -hmm. which tells that these elements which grow, they have a certain universal scale length. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, the, there seems to be no obvious scaling relation between the planets at this in our planetary system. We don't have a universal scale that on which we can plot all the planets of the planet of our system that they will behave. So is this hydrodynamic model which you mentioned but haven't shown how it looks like and I have no focus idea what it actually means, right? Yeah, uh, uh, whether this uh, it, it does have this scaling globe built in it or it's not. So for the streaming instability in principle has um, uh, the scaling loss. So these models that are done are scale free. We can we can so the H means basically the scale height of gas. So then if we just um, change the number, it will correspond either to 1 AU or to 10 AU and so on in the disk. However, important thing is that they are done assuming some sort of this, of this Stokes number, right, of the pebbles. And the translation between the Stokes number and the actual grain size, it, this, it cannot be really scale-free, right? Because the aerodynamic interaction between dust grains and gas, um, depends on, on exactly how large are the dust grains. Um, so in this sense, the, the whole like theory cannot really be scale-free. And we have to do, if we consider dust coagulation, we have to, re, uh, to put the physical units in the models. So, so this is like a short answer about well, the so, so, so <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm still confused. I mean, so is, is there any scaling or not? I mean, our planetary system, there is, or I'm completely mistaken, there is a scaling law in, a, in our solar system, which I am not aware of it. I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by a scaling. But we, we have a certain number of uh, planets in our yeah. system, which have been formed and probably they are formed by the same mechanism, right? So if this is a hydrodynamic mechanism of the coagulation or mm -hmm. accretion of whatever, then there should be a scaling law. There yeah. should be universal, universal relation, which I could have written yeah. that the mass of the planet in that particular system is 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 a some yeah I think the primordial, primordial size to the power of something. I mean, usually yeah. the scaling laws are power laws, right? I think so the problem that, is that yeah. I should be able to plot the planets of a planetary system on a logarithmic scale, and they should all fill. Yeah, uh, a straight line. Yeah, uh, as far as I know, there is no such there is no such a straight line in the, in the our for solar system. Or I am completely mistaken. I have I not. Think you can think of a, of a yeah. So if we look, come back here. You can think of the giant planets as kind of following some sort of line, right? And many people also, if they just take the distances. On the log scale, they are pretty much uniformly distributed. There will be two scalings for a rocky yeah. planet, for a gas planet. Yeah, right? exactly. But that, I think that, a general that, that problem. Be is, there are two different mechanisms. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. And I think the general problem is in these kind of multifaceted processes. So there will be, of course, some scaling laws for the dust growth. There will be scaling law for streaming instability. But as I said, there are some locations in the disk, like the snow line, that are more likely or more favorable in triggering whole the process. 
So this whole process doesn't happen at every location in the disk at the same time. And then- Why did there are nucleation sites there, right? Exactly. So I think that's, that's what is kind of destroying this easy scaling clause of all the components of planets. Not necessarily, I mean, uh, it just happened that fi exactly 50, well, almost 50 years ago, Jim Langer and I, we wrote a paper on how that kind of accretion is going on in the, in the very sophisticated hydrodynamic models. And we have this, then, then you have a variety of scaling laws, but they again scale in some sense. So that, that was, okay. Anyway, I understand that there are these, in our pro solar system, there are these two things a lot. I learned, I learned something that's important. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. We have one more question from uh, Wojtek Helbing, please. Thank you very much. I suppose that I really took some time. Uh, thank you, Anna, very nice presentation. Uh, well, I learned a lot. Uh, you structurize and, 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 and put the knowledge, uh, this amazing uh, progress that uh, has been done in the planetary science recently it was hard to follow but you know it's, it's a it's a rapid explosion of observation so my question is the following uh, what would you be the best guess how you can put some um, of the elements of this theory into observational tests my, my question stems from the fact that the planetary disk we can observe now come only from the really high metal high metal rich pop one stars of course the sun is also population one stars but we have a gradient in metallicity uh, and I would assume that the abundance of elements, especially like aluminium uh, 26 and all this radioactive uh, heating might be dependent somehow on this. So can, can, can you have any idea if we can test somehow this, this uh, observationally or what would be the repercussion of the metallicity gradient? Yeah, this is, this is literally what I wrote in my ERC grant application. That's like, give me money because I need to do this model that we will be able to benchmark. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm glad that this is so obvious <laughs> that it needs to be done. But since basically the, 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 this kind of models that will go all the way don't exist yet, right? Because we have still the separate models for dust growth and then some prescriptions for, for the streaming instability part. And then we have like totally different set of mo models that assume that the planetary cores are already there and kind of do some assumptions about the previous stages. Like this is exactly why we cannot yet do these predictions. But I completely agree that given the diversity of exoplanets and given the fact that not all the star is like the sun and especially not just because of mass but also because of the metallicity that co people completely neglect basically now that the many host stars of, of, of these like Kepler exoplanets, they formed a little bit earlier than the sun, right? And the protoplanetary disks that we are observing now, clearly they form much later than the sun. So potentially the conditions are so different that we, out of the protoplanetary disks that we have now, we will form different sets of planets than the ones that we are now detected. So I think that it is extremely interesting to, to look at this. Okay, so I will stay tuned and then good luck with the URC proposal. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, do we have any, any further questions? I don't see any raised hands. Okay, I guess then we should thank our speaker uh, again. Uh, so thank you, Anna, again for the talk. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs>